You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. As we look to this passage of Scripture, we're, we're looking at um, Paul's call to wives, and that's the majority of the passage we see here. And at the end, he'll talk about, or not Paul, Peter, talking about God's call for wives. And then at the end here, we'll be looking at, in the last verse, um, his addressing the husbands there in the church as well. And so I think it's good that before we get into this text, uh, we talk about some clarification. Uh, I think there, uh, whenever we talk about these things, there could be some feelings of, ah, oh, I don't know if I like that, and, and emotions that come along with some of these things. And I think clarification is important. And what did the scripture say overall when we talk about the relationship of a uh, husband and wife together? And so as we think of these things, and think of the idea that Scripture, not just in our passage here this morning, but in in a couple different passages as well, that we see that wives are called to submit to their husbands. And we should note that when we see this, this is a willing submission that is called for. As Vodi Bauckham points out, nowhere do the Scriptures tell the husbands to make their wives submit. Uh, That would be a violation of the relationship in the roles of husbands and wives. Because <clears throat> what we're talking about here is husband and wives as equal together, equally created in the image of God, and therefore having equal value and dignity before God together. And as we'll see, Peter also points out, each are equal recipients and participants in God's grace and eternal life and salvation. And so they are equal together. And we bring up this clarification because some look at the idea of submission and think that that implies inferiority. Uh, But I would argue the Bible completely rejects that idea. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul explains the distinction in roles of men and women. The head of the household is the husband as God has designed. And we've discussed before that biblical leadership means servanthood. That's what leadership is. The one who is in authority has authority to be in a position to serve those that he leads. And we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul shows the order of headship and willful submission. And he does this by showing the relationship between man and Christ, woman and man, and Christ and God the Father. And we see that this points to the idea of functionality in the relationships. And so, for example, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says this, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And so, again, by this we see that the headship and submission has nothing to do with being inferior or one having greater or lesser value than the other within those roles. And so not to take too much time to explain this, uh, we see that the head of Christ is God the Father. And so would we say then, if that's the case, that that Christ is inferior to God the Father? Uh, Does this mean then that, that Christ is less divine than God? That he is less worthy of worship and praise and glory in any way? No, absolutely not. Christ is fully God. He is equally God. But in his role in the eternal plan of salvation, Christ is subject to the Father. And so I think we see here that this cannot mean inferiority or less in the the roles that are played in any way. But instead of being inferior roles, we see that these are complementary roles when we talk about the roles of men and women. And in the playing out of the relationship between husband and wife, Both the husband and the wife relate to each other out of their submission to God. 
both of them submitting to God and so playing out the roles that God has given each of them. God has designed marriage, and out of the submission to him that each one has, the husband and wife both function as God has designed each of their roles. And as we see, Peter here calls wives to submit in the same manner as he is called for submitting to the government or for slaves submitting to their masters. Uh, we see he's, he's saying, subject yourself uh, to those who are in authority over you. So why subject yourself in the same way to your husbands? But this in no way should be understood as saying that the relationship of husband and wives is the same as one to the government or to slaves to their masters. As one pastor points out in, in relationship to this passage here in 1 Peter, he points out that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that the wife belongs to her husband, and also the husband belongs to his wife. So there is mutuality in the marriage, and yet there are distinct roles that be played out of headship and submission. And so we need to understand these things and, and not bring a lot of what our culture tries to uh, bring to this and the baggage that they try to in, uh, invade these passages with. Uh, we want to say, what did the author intend to say? What is God's true design for marriage and the relationships to look the way they do uh, throughout Scripture? And so as we come to our text here, remember, Peter is writing to these churches in Asia Minor that were facing persecution and trials of various kinds. And as we've looked through the idea of authority and submission these past few weeks, it could even be true that some of those various trials could be coming to believers who are under the authority of unbelievers. And so the problems that that would bring for them as these believers, above all, are submitting themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that they do this because they are no longer who they used to be. Peter has said that they have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so we see in this letter, Peter is calling these churches to stand firm and pursue holiness. Uh, that is what he is calling them to in response to their suffering, in response to the persecutions that they face. And what we saw when we got to chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, is that we were starting there a new section, if you remember. A section that I would argue goes all the way into the beginning of chapter 4. And there in chapter 2, in verses 11 and 12, we see that believers are strangers and aliens in this world. And as aliens and strangers, we are to abstain from fleshly passions that war against our souls. And in doing so, keeping our conduct among unbelievers as honorable, where we also said that could be translated as attractive. And then Peter unfolds what that looks like as he addresses three areas of authority that Christians are to submit themselves to. And so we looked at the first two, these last two Sundays, and the first one was human institutions or specifically governing authorities. And then last Sunday we talked about household slaves submitting themselves to their masters. And so now today we see that wives are to submit themselves to their husbands. But again, in all of our submission, in any of the area where we find ourselves under another authority, we have to recognize that our submission to that authority ultimately comes because of our submission to our Lord and that our submission to the Lord Jesus Christ is first and foremost. And therefore, as we've seen already, there are maybe times where, because of our allegiance to Jesus Christ above all else, it may bring us into conflict with those unbelieving authorities that are over us from time to time. That in order to obey Jesus Christ, we may not be able to obey those authorities. And so even though we are doing what is right, we may find ourselves suffering and therefore suffering unjustly. And we saw Peter call believers then in such cases to follow the example of Jesus Christ, to suffer as he suffered. That though he suffered as a criminal, he had done no wrong, no sin. And so we follow his example. But again, in all of this, we see what it is to live as strangers in this world, abstaining from sin and keeping our conduct before unbelievers as honorable. And again, why are we to do that? 
What is the goal in doing that? Well, Peter said there back in chapter 2, verse 12, so that when unbelievers speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And that whole concept of the day of visitation, glorifying God then, uh, we said was a reference to salvation. That when Christ comes, those who spoke evil against us will glorify him for his great salvation because through our lives he has drawn them to himself and he has saved them. When they heard the gospel, they repented and believed. And so I think what we look at here this morning is a great example of one way that God may use the life of his children, of believers, to draw unbelievers to himself, that when they hear the gospel, they would repent, they would be saved. And so let's read our passage here for this morning. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And so as we start here in verse 1, Peter starts off by addressing wives. And he starts off by saying, likewise. Or it could be translated, in the same way. Well, again, as we already referenced, we, we talked about, well, in the same way as what? Likewise to what? Well, as he was previously talking about submission to the governing authorities or, or slave submission to their masters uh, and submitting to authority that is over us, he's saying, likewise, wives, submit to the authority of your own husbands. And, and notice, too, he's saying to your own husbands. Wives aren't called to submit to everyone else's husbands or to every other man, only the authorities that are over us. So wives submit to your own husbands. Now, like we discussed last week, uh, the principles that Peter was giving and talking to slaves submitting to their masters, we said those principles apply to the whole church. Well, here we see what he's saying addresses and applies to all the wives there in the church, We see that he is specifically speaking to wives that have unbelieving husbands. And we see this with the reason that he gives for wives to subject themselves to their husbands. He says, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So saying husbands that do not obey the word, it shows that these are husbands that are unbelievers. And we've seen Peter talk like this Uh, already going through this letter. We saw him refer to obedience to Jesus as talking about the salvation of God's elect there in chapter 1, verse 2. And in chapter 1, verse 22, Peter refers to his reader's obedience to the truth, which we discussed as obedience to the gospel, the gospel that commands repentance and faith. And and then we saw to the opposite in chapter 2, verse 8, where those who reject Christ, who stumble over him, do so because they disobey the word. They disobey the gospel, which again commands repentance and faith. And so it fits here what Peter is saying, that when he references husbands who do not obey the word, he's referring to men who reject Jesus Christ, who do not obey the gospel and therefore do not believe. And we'll see also him continue to talk this way when we get into chapter 3 and and 2 again when we see it in chapter 4. Now, though, it is not only wives with unbelieving husbands that he is addressing here and saying to submit to their husbands. 
And we see this because he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word. So all wives are addressed here, but again, particularly those wives who have unbelieving husbands. And he's calling them to submit. He's calling to, for them to live their lives in a certain way. These, again, these wives in the church who have trusted in Christ, they too are no longer who they used to be, like anyone else who has trusted in Christ. These wives are children of God since they have trusted in him. They belong to Christ. They belong to the one whom they submit to as their Lord. And again, it is out of their submission to Christ that these wives are to be subject to their own husbands. So her submission is to Christ first and foremost. But to the specific point that Peter makes here, she is to submit so that her unbelieving husband may be one without a word by her conduct. So believing wives as not only aliens and strangers in this world, but sometimes, too, if they have an unbelieving husband, they may find themselves as an alien and stranger in their own home because they're not who they used to be. They're not following the same pagan practices they once did. They're not submitting to the, the household religion submitted by, or established by their husband because that's not who they are anymore. Now they're a follower of Jesus Christ. She's new. She's different. And so finding herself as a stranger in her own home, Peter is calling her to live in such a way that her husband may be won over. And again, won over without a word by her conduct. Now, as he is calling wives to submit in the hopes that their husbands will be won over, uh, this shouldn't be mistaken by saying that if she does submit herself, it guarantees that her husband will be won over and brought to Christ. Uh, That's not what's being said here. But if she does her part and plays her role in the hopes that he will be brought to Christ, she still has to understand it's ultimately in God's hands. Because salvation is always in God's hands and in God's hands alone. So my friend, if you yourself are living with an unbeliever in your home, then the call to you is for you to do your part, to conduct yourself before those unbelievers in an honorable way, that you take up your responsibility and as you do, continue to lift that person up, to pray for that person, entrusting them to God that he may bring them to repentance and faith. Trust God in all that is happening because it is God who saves. Do your part and trust God. Pray to God that the person may be brought to life out of their sin, that they would repent and believe and be saved. And again, the hope of being saved that he'd be one to obedience to the word without a word. Because the husband now again is, by not being a believer, by rejecting Christ, is disobeying the word. And so by saying that he'd be one without a word, as some point out, it seems that that Peter is using a, a play on words. And the idea of being one over without a word, most argue, is pointing to the tendency that some women may have that when there's a problem with their husband, uh, when something needs to be corrected or fixed, that they, they may have the tendency to nag their husband about it or to be contentious with their husband about it. So when their husband needs to trust in Christ, they may have the tendency to nag him about trusting in Christ. When are you going to do that? You have to do that. Come on, you got to get on that. Why aren't you trusting in Christ? Can't you see? And, and, and even get, again, contentious about it. And Peter's saying, no, don't, don't do that. Even for wives whose husbands are believers, uh, but maybe they're, they're lacking in, in fulfilling their role as a leader in the home. Or, or maybe he's not loving you as he should. Or, or maybe he's just not getting to the honeydew list. Or, or he's not helping around the house as you wish he was. In, in any case, nagging him about these things or being contentious with him about these things is, is not the answer. 
Uh, that kind of response from anybody to anybody is never the answer. But especially, again, to wives. As we see, for example, in, in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 15, it says, A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. They are frustrating, right? And also we see in Proverbs 21, verse 9, it says, It is better to live in a corner of the housetop, a really uncomfortable and inconvenient place to be, <clears throat> than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. And then we see in Proverbs verse 19, verse, or chapter 19, verse 13, it says, We see here then two ways that uh, a man is wrecked in this passage. It says, A foolish son is ruined to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. I don't know, did ancient Israelites have a problem with leaky roofs? That there's this, this reference to, yeah. But either way, we, we see the point here. Being quarrelsome or nagging um, is not the way to win someone over. Wives, you want your husbands to be more like Christ? Don't badger them about their failures. Uh, don't, don't come against them in a rage. That's not going to help. If anything, you're just going to push them further away. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't talk about it. I'm not saying don't have a conversation with them. Do so, and do it lovingly and respectfully. But when you have a conversation, don't keep coming back and, and, and to it and pushing the issue and, and, and being aggressive about the issue over and over again. But instead, when you've had the conversation in a loving and respectful way about the need to grow in Christ-likeness, then turn around and yourself demonstrate Christ-likeness to them in your own life. That's what is being called for here, instead of being contentious. And if your husbands are not saved, then be keeping your conduct before them honorable in the hopes that they will see your good deeds and glorify God when Christ appears, in the hopes that God will use your life demonstrated before them to draw your unbelieving husband to yourself. As we see there, verse 2 says, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. The word respectful there in verse 2 is the Greek word for fear. And so show your husband the change that Christ has made in you, that out of your submission to your Lord, your behavior towards your husband and in general has changed, that you're not who you used to be, that you live in reverent fear of God, obeying God above all else. And so have that same respect and reverence for your husband. And again, too, this respect, but also to her conduct must be pure. And not just sexually pure, but pure altogether. Uh, the word is for holiness. He's calling for a holy conduct. Let your husband see your changed life. And if it's your life that's to be on display before your husband, your life that's to be used by God to draw him to Christ, then do not be tempted to try and win your husband over by your outward appearance. Verse 3 says, do not let your adorning be external. In the, the Greco-Roman culture, women often would commit themselves to adorning themselves with fancy clothes and expensive clothes and, and jewelry and other things and, and doing their hair in certain ways and, and even sexualizing themselves in these things. And this would serve to draw attention to themselves and to try to win their husband's favor by either in public adorning themselves in such a way that it would show their, their husband's power and wealth, or to even just to make themselves more appealing to their husband, usually in a sexual way. Peter is saying, don't let that be the way you try to win your husband over. Now, this isn't saying then that, that wives shouldn't want to be attractive to their husbands. And it's not saying that one should not care uh, about their appearance altogether or, or whether or not they're, they're, they're put together or not. Uh, this isn't saying that, that jewelry or makeup or fixing your hair is necessarily wrong. 
that's, that's not the point. Um, in talking about how one dresses and what they put on and whether makeup or jewelry and how they do their hair, uh, whether that's a, a, a sinful problem or not really depends on the heart attitude. Uh, with what heart am I dressing myself with? And what heart, what is my motives and why I, I, I care about my appearance in the way that I do? It's the heart attitude that matters when it comes to those things. Uh, when it comes to uh, being modest in a, in a sexual way, I, I do think there is an, an, an absolute line, an objective line that one can cross and say you're, you're not being modest anymore. Uh, but even before that line, again, it still depends on the heart attitude. You know, why do you dress the way? Is the whole point to draw attention to yourself and make it about you? Or, or are you just putting yourself together? Because there could also be a immodesty in not caring about your appearance <laughs> and being so unaware of yourself that you then again are drawing attention to yourself. Um, so again, the heart attitude is what matters when it comes to that. So, so I do not believe Peter is saying that, that jewelry and makeup and, and certain clothing and, and fixing your hair is, is necessarily wrong. That, that's not the point. But the wife should not be trying to win her husband over by her outward appearance. The wife of an unbelieving husband, and I would argue too, of a, of a husband who is a believer but, but still needs to grow in Christ, which, which one of us doesn't, right? We all still do. But her goal is not to point her husband to herself. Her ultimate goal is to point her husband to Jesus. That by the life she lives, she's saying, look at how great Jesus is. Look how beautiful he is. Look what he has done to change me. He saved me, and now I'm no longer who I used to be because of him. Look how glorious, look how awesome Jesus is. That's her goal. That's what she's trying to do as she lives her life before her husband. So again, wives, do not win your husband over by your outward attractiveness and so attract him to you alone. Don't try to use uh, your beauty. Verse 4 says, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And notice, notice what Peter calls this here. He calls this imperishable beauty. Physical beauty whether we like to talk about it or not, still the truth of the matter, physical beauty fades. And for some of us who have not restricted ourselves from Krispy Kreme donuts as much as we should have, for some of us it fades a little quicker than for others, but for all of us it fades. But inner beauty is imperishable. And that's what Peter is calling for here. Now, again, we, we've shown Peter is saying this to wives for them to keep their conduct before their unbelieving husbands as honorable and attractive, right? But I think we see here, too, and so we should ask the question, honorable and, or attractive to who? Uh, when we first started this section in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and we saw Peter call for the whole church to be keeping their conduct before unbelievers as honorable or attractive, uh, we said that sometimes, as we're obeying Christ above all else, that that means there's going to be things we do that, that make our conduct unattractive to unbelievers as we follow our Lord. And so again, who is this being attractive to? In whose sight? We, we live our lives before unbelievers, but I think it's very clear that the one who is to consider our conduct as attractive is God. Is it attractive to him that even as this wife lives to show her inner beauty, her, her quiet and gentle spirit, that that is something that is attractive, that is honorable to God? As Peter says here that the, the, this inner beauty is precious in God's sight. That's what matters. Does, is our lives and what we do precious to God? Is it honorable to God? As we live this life before in the presence of unbelievers. And why is by living this way with your husband, being subject to your husband, you're not living for your husband. You're not even living for yourself. 
by living with your husband in this way, you're living for God. And then in verse 5, Peter appeals to the Old Testament women who were heroes of the faith as examples for women in the church to follow. These women pleased God and so lived holy lives, and they dressed themselves with such imperishable inner beauty by submitting to their own husbands. Peter specifically gives Sarah, the mother of the nation of Israel, as a prime example there in verse 6. As he says, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Peter specifically points out Sarah's obedience to her husband Abraham and how she referred to him as Lord or Master. And again, I think he's pointing to that inward submissive attitude, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. We see Sarah calling Abraham Lord is a clear reference to Genesis 18, verse 12, because that's where it's at least recorded for us that she called him Lord. And if you were to look to that passage, you would see that Sarah calls Abraham Lord in this offside comment that she makes to herself. Uh, She's talking to herself when she says this. And one commentator points out that Peter is commenting on a situation where Sarah is still referring to Abraham as Lord, even though she's speaking to herself. And so he says that even in casual situations, Sarah respected Abraham's leadership, revealing thereby that her honor of him was part of the warp and woof of her life. In other words, the respect that she showed to Abraham was not just in public for show, so that other people would think she was a good wife. But it was the truth of her inner person. It was the overflow of who she really was, and therefore her respect for Abraham was genuine. And this is the example Peter calls for wives to follow. And so calling for wives to follow this example, he then goes on to say, And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, just as Abraham is the father of all those who are justified by faith, that is, it is his example that is followed, and all who follow after him are in the family of faith and therefore have Abraham as their father. In the same way, all who follow Sarah's example of submission to their husbands are daughters of Sarah and are so doing what is good, or in other words, doing what is God's revealed will. And so living out of an attitude of respectful submission to her husband, even when maybe a husband tries to intimidate his wife, that maybe in times where we are submitting ultimately to our Lord may bring us in conflict with an unbelieving husband, yet still she continues to do what is good, even if that husband tries to intimidate her or make her fear. And so he says, doing good and not fear anything that is frightening. I do think that's what best fits this context as we we go through this section of submitting to authorities and submitting to God above all else, submitting for the Lord's sake. And women who live this way show that their hope is in nothing of this world. Their hope isn't even in their marriage, or their marriage being what they they wish it would be. That's not where their hope is. Women who live this way show that their hope is ultimately in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. That these are women who have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That he has purchased for them an inheritance kept for them by God. That women, you yourselves are guarded by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed when Christ returns. So keep your conduct before unbelievers honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So by living this way, wives wives living this way with unbelieving husbands, They may be used by God to draw their husbands to himself. 
that God would use their lives to affect their husbands. And living this way, even in a husband that might blame you for how things are in the house, how the, the family life is going, that he accuses you that it's all your fault. Or when, it's, when you're his excuse to why he doesn't leave the house as he should. Live in such a way that when he says such things, he knows he's dead wrong. And if a husband is being cruel, and he's the one nagging, and he's the one badgering, or being demeaning, the wife's position should be to not do anything that's going to escalate the situation, but to calm the situation down by her attitude, by her submission. And this is true for anybody. As we read in Psalm 15, verse 1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Don't let your pride cause you to respond in such a way that you're going to escalate the situation. But have a humble attitude and do what will turn away wrath. Now, since the beginning of this section, Peter has been addressing those who are in a position to suffer. And he has been addressing, again, the church suffering persecution. And throughout this specific section, he has been addressing those who would suffer under the hands of unbelievers who have authority over them. But as we come to verse 7 here, Peter shifts what he's been doing a little bit. And instead of addressing those who are suffering under unbelievers who have authority over them, he addresses those who are in authority that are within the church. He here addresses the husbands. And he does so, as he says here, starting off with the word likewise. One, I think this word shows that he's now addressing a different people. And if there's any way in which this shows a similarity to what he has been saying, it is, can't be in the idea of submission. Again, that doesn't fit the context. But I believe it would be in the fact as Peter's been calling wives to live out their role that God has given them in their marriage, he likewise now is going to call husbands to live out their role that God has given them in the marriage. And so for this reason, he finds it necessary to address the husbands in the church, the believing husbands in the church. And the first thing we see that is the Lord's will for the husband is to live with your wives in an understanding way. Or literally it says, live with your wives according to knowledge. Husbands, you need to know your wives. Know your wives. Know her so that you can be considerate and loving towards her. So that you can be considerate and loving knowing her intellectual or emotional or physical needs and desires. Know your wives. Now you may say, I do know my wife. I've known her for years. And so I, I learned and knew my wife years ago. I, I know her. I'm, I'm good. I can be considerate and loving because I, I know her. I, I learned all about her. Well, Suzanne and I, we've, this October, we'll have been married for 14 years. Um, this September, I'll have known her for 22 years. Wow. That's crazy. Anyway. But even who she was 22 years ago, who she was 14 years ago, she's not that person today. She's not who she was five years ago. She's not who she was last year. She's not who she was last week. And the truth is, none of us are. As experience, as circumstances, as whatever it is, uh, the, the church together, the God's working through his word in our lives, and all kinds of things that change all aspects about us. Uh, our maturity and growth, our thinking, uh, our, our behavior, our taste, our sensitivity to things, and all, name it. It's... It's constantly being shaped and formed for all of us and changing all the time. So for a husband to say, I know my wife. No, you don't. 
You need to be knowing her, getting to know her, learning her all the time. Husbands, know your wives by being a professional student of your wife. Always be learning of her so that you can be considerate and loving towards her in every aspect of your marriage, whether in public or in the privacy of your home. Know her so that you can love her in every way that God has called you to love her. You must be knowing your wife and growing in that knowledge continually. Knowing your wife, not for who she was, but for who she is. And maybe in some circumstances, knowing your wife for not what you wish of her and what she would be, but for who she is. And live with her, showing her love and consideration accordingly. And by doing this, Peter says that you are showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Knowing your wife shows that you value her. You know, in the the Greco-Roman culture, uh, the wife was a little more than a slave. Uh, She was to do what she was told, and she had no voice, but God has not designed marriage that way. The wife is to be shown respect. She is to be treated as the precious gift of God to you that she is. Again, this is showing her honor as the woman that is the weaker vessel. Now, saying she's a weaker vessel, uh, that's in reference to the fact that men are, in general, usually stronger than the woman. And therefore, women could end up in a situation where the man takes advantage of her weakness, and he tries to intimidate her and control her. And for anyone that may be tempted to do that, I think there should be a great warning given to that person who would mistreat his wife or any other woman to take advantage of her physical weakness. Be warned that God is a God of justice, and he has stored up his wrath against all the wickedness of men. So any man who would be tempted to take advantage of his wife's physical weakness should be warned and repent. We should understand what God has given to each of us who he has given a wife to. Husbands, know your wife. That's what a godly man does. Showing honor to your wife, showing how much you value your wife. It is not a godly man, but a weak, cowardly boy who exploits his physical strength over his wife. The man of God instead honors his wife in word and deed. The godly man leads his wife and his whole family, for that matter, using his strength to serve his family. That's what God calls you as men to do, and myself as a man to do. And then Peter gives two reasons for a man to live with his wife according to knowledge, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And the first reason he gives is that she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. Again, women are equal, equally created in the image of God, and so are equal in dignity, in value. And they are equal when it comes to salvation. Christ has equally died for each one who believes upon him. She is just as much born again and has just as much a living hope and the same inheritance of eternal life kept by God for her. And if Christ came not to be served, but to serve and offer his life a ransom for her, just as he offered his life a ransom for you. What reason do you have to treat her any less and to show her any less love than the love that Christ has shown to both of you? No, know your wives and live with her accordingly, loving her and showing her honor. And then the second reason Peter gives husbands to live with their wives in this way is so that their prayers won't be hindered. We see here in this passage and in other passages 
that sin hinders our prayers. And it is a sin not to live with your wife in this way. You know, maybe you say, well, yeah, but you don't know my wife. <laughs> you don't know what I deal with. You don't know what she's, you don't. And I'll grant it to you, maybe I don't know. But guess what? God hasn't called you to your role in any way that is dependent on how your wife fulfills her role. And wives, the same thing goes for you. God hasn't called you to fulfill your role in dependency on how your husband fulfills his. God calls you to fulfill your role. You know, people talk about marriage being 50-50. It's not. I haven't heard one meaningful, well-meaning pastor say that marriage was 60-40. That ain't true either. Marriage is 100%. I am called to do my part, despite what my spouse does. I am called to be the husband in submission to Christ. And wives are called to be the wives that God wants them to be in submission to Christ. That's how you are to live. And so husbands, despite what your wives are doing, one, are you praying for them? And how are you living and fulfilling your role? And if you're praying for them, but you're not fulfilling your role, you have no reason to expect your prayers to be answered. And any time we live in unrepentant sin, God has not obligated himself to answer our prayers. Sin will cause us to be hindered in our walk and relationship with God. So we must repent and seek him and live in submission to our Lord. So husbands, are you living in submission to your Lord? Are you doing your part that God has called you to as a husband? Wives, are, are you submitting to your Lord? Or are you doing your part that God has called you to as a wife? What is your marriage putting on display to a watching world of unbelievers? What is your marriage in private? What is it putting on display before your God? God has a design for marriage for his purposes, for his plan. And we have responsibilities and a role to play within our marriage. And we each should see our marriage as the precious gift and treasure that it is. And in these situations where there may be an unbeliever in the house, and it may cause problems and suffering for us, Peter is saying, keep your conduct before the unbeliever as honorable, as attractive, that God may use your life to draw that unbeliever to yourself. So whatever your circumstances are, whatever your trouble be, trust it to God, seek him, pray to him, and fulfill the responsibility that he has given to you in hopes that he will use you to bring others, even an unbelieving spouse, to Jesus Christ through your life. Can you trust God in that way? No matter what the authority is that is over us, no matter what the circumstance may be, can we trust God in that way? And know that he will work for his glory and honor through us, no matter what the circumstances and no matter what the outcome and that we would be responsible to the position in life that he has given us to live not for our spouse, to live not for ourselves, but to live for our God. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nbbc.com.